on that. They said, whether you're in here or not, we're starting when it's starting time, and uh, you can get in on it. But it sounded good coming in. We're glad to see you tonight. Appreciate you being here and uh, joining in as we worship the Lord and give praise unto him. I'm sure we are thankful for his blessings upon us today and for this privilege again to be here to worship the Lord tonight. That prayer request you might want to mention before we pray. Yeah, we pray for Tony. He's with us this morning, but he needs our prayers tonight. Our niece. Our niece in South Carolina, please pray for her. There are some decisions that need to be made about her, and uh, so pray for the family. Pray for Miriam. She is a, she's a, well, I don't know what to say. <laughs> uh, she's here. She said, just say, I'm here. Just say, I'm here. She didn't know whether she was going to be here or not. Uh, been, when he gets this kind of weather, kind of rough on her, and so she's here tonight. Uh, pray, we pray for Sharon. Jimmy and Sharon was here, but all of us are very much aware of Sharon with all of her allergies and all the stuff she battles. And if she gets close to somebody that uh, took a bath in perfume... I'm not saying you did that, <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, with all these people here and she walks by so many people and she gets that in her system, it just shuts down her breathing. And so Jim's had to take her home. And uh, so we pray, we pray for her tonight uh, as well. All right, we pray for this concern. Yes. Pay for my mom with the uh, Black Mountain home. Uh, we're going to lock down again. And this will affect her. All right. Let's pray for this special need prayer. My brother Bob's ankle going on four years, I think. And they've done three major surgeries. And he can't walk from here to the parking lot. He needs prayer all the way. All right. Let's lift this need up in prayer. Yes. One of the kids that I believe said he's four. He had to get his appendix removed this morning. All right. Let's remember this concern. Yes. I need to do it hands wise. They got the COVID, so remember this. All right. Let's remember this concern. Yes. Do I have others? Continue to remember my mother-in-law. She's still in the hospital. And remember Bill and Lynn, Queen's daughter, having a pacemaker put in this coming Friday. And uh, they would appreciate prayers for her as well. Miss Effie, we... All right, we pray. We pray for her. Pray for Reuben. He'll be having a procedure done on Tuesday morning. All right, let's remember Mr. Reuben in our prayers. Have others. Everybody got somebody on your heart tonight, and we believe in prayer. Amen. That's why we come to pray, and we uh, take this time to call out to the Lord in prayer and pray for these uh, needs that we are made aware of, and even those we don't know about. But aren't you glad the Lord knows about them? Amen. He knows who they are. He knows what the need is. Uh, we pray for those that are in the parking lot. We have. Uh, folks that uh, just uh, because of their health issues uh, have uh, chosen to stay in the car and they can pick this up on the radio and they can hear us and be a part of the service and we have guys that are outside and uh, sort of keeping watch over the parking lot, uh, you know. Uh, I wouldn't tell you all that goes on that up and down the road while we're in here, but there are a lot of things that go on up and down the road. And so they're out there just keeping an eye on things and uh, we pray for them and uh, their sacrifice, their labor of love uh, to be out there and to make sure everything is okay. So we pray for them as well. So we pray for one another tonight. And so let's bow our hearts together. Brother Manny, would you pray with us, please, sir? Father, we come up to you with concerns in our hearts for so many that are in need of a touch from your Holy Spirit. You told 
Daniel that before he even started praying, you had sent help for him, Lord. Yes. So we know that you are so faithful, Lord, that you are about to supply to us more abundantly than what we need, because you are, Lord, the, the provider. You are Jehovah Rapha. You are the one that healed. You are Jehovah Nisi. You yes. are our banner, the standard, Lord. And we thank you because of the things you're about to do. We ask of you, Lord, to remember those who are in need in the hospitals and the homes right now. Those who are listening through the radio, Lord, that you will bless them in such a way, Father, that they will come over here to testify the greatness of you. Amen. Lord. Yes. God, thank you, Lord, we say from our hearts in Jesus' name and the church says. Amen. All right, let's sing together again. Here, if you will. one of these days do you do you remember I may date myself just a little bit here tonight but some of you are white headed as I am so I know you're old as I am and some of you don't even have any hair so uh, you know whatever what difference does it make uh, do you remember Wesley Grant uh, from Asheville do you remember him some of you are too young for that I'm telling you some of you Wesley and his wife, they had a TV broadcast on Channel 13 on Sunday morning. When I was growing up, that, that played in my home. My daddy and mama listened to it, and, you know, uh, this is a black guy, pastored in Asheville all of his life. His wife, Hun, you remember, Hun was his wife. Well, I don't ever know what her name was. That's all he called her, Hun. Hun, will you do this, and Hun, will you do that? I thought he stays on pretty good ground by calling her that. But anyway, anyway, one of his favorite songs, that sing and sing and sing. This is one of their favorite songs that they would sing, I Fly Away. And uh, no matter where he went, and he had, this, he had this thing of when they'd sing, I Fly Away, that he'd reach in his pocket and pull out his handkerchief, and he'd get up there and shake it, and it would be about this big. And when you sing the chorus, he'd get that big handkerchief and he'd start waving that handkerchief. And I'll fly away. And, uh, you know, made the impression of one day he thought he's going to fly away. And, and he did when the Lord called him home. Uh, before he died, uh, I went down to uh, Greensboro for our 
state convention. And uh, guess who was sitting right on the front row? There's 2,000 pastors there in this, in, this, uh, in this auditorium. And right on the front, there sat Wesley Grant. And uh, they had the program all fi figured out, you know, what they're going to do and who's going to do this and do that. Well, I'm just saying, if you've ever been in a black church, you ever preached in a black, black, uh, black church or sung in a black church, they had no program. The program is what you felt like doing. And uh, so they went along sort of following the program, and he sat down as long as he could. And he jumps up on the platform, and he said, I just, I just got to sing. And it shocked the rest of them. And he jerked out that big old handkerchief, and he started singing, I'll fly away, I'll fly away. And waving that handkerchief. Well, there's about half of that crowd knew what he was singing about, and the rest of them, they didn't know what he was singing about. They probably never had heard that in their church. But boy, we sung it on that day, and he got that handkerchief. And uh, I thought about uh, when we were singing that, I'd pull my handkerchief out, and, and we'd do that. But my wife was looking at me and said, you better not do that because you didn't get a clean handkerchief this morning and put it in your pocket. And you better not pull that out. <laughs> and so, uh, so I'll be kind to you, uh, you know, and won't do that. But we're gonna sing that last verse again, again. You believe there's coming a day when we're all gonna fly away? Amen. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'm gonna fly away. Just a few more days, it's not gonna be long. Just a few more days. can for somebody smile at them we're glad to have some guests with us tonight and we're glad to have some folks over here that I hadn't seen in a long time they knew me a long time ago don't ask them anything about how I was a long time ago they ain't a telling uh, but we we've known each other for a long time we're glad they come to worship with us tonight as you shake hands introduce yourself to them and these are folks from Avery County I mean man they came from way over there in God's country so shake hands with somebody if you will.
And I'd ask you also to pray for Roger and his family tonight. He's, he's filling in, preaching at a church tonight, and we want to lift him up in our prayers, and so we pray for him as well. Genesis chapter 12. If you'll take your Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 12. We've been doing a survey in our Sunday school class about the Old Testament, and sort of uh, we sort of looked at some major terms about Abraham. One of the great men of faith. He is the supreme example of faith in the Bible. Everything that you need to know about living by faith, you can find in the life of Abraham. This Old Testament man, whom the Bible says, is the father of the faithful. So our faith, of course, we know that it originates with God. But as we live out our faith, finds its roots in the man Abraham. God had called him. Uh, we have looked at a few thoughts about Abraham. Called him away from his family, away from his friends. And he began to live a life of faith. God said to him, leave. And Abraham obeyed. He responded to the call of God with trust and obedience. And I would say tonight that that principle has not changed from... Abraham up unto this day that our response to what God said to us is to trust and obey. The hymn writer said, For there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And the trust that Abraham had led him out of the land of the earth of the Chaldees and led him into the land of Canaan. He entered the land by crossing over the Jordan River. And this is the same river that his descendants would cross over many centuries later. The first step of his faith led him to Shechem, I'll read the passage in Genesis 12, verse 7 and 8. Well, let's go back if you don't mind. Debbie, I'll ask you if you don't mind to go back to verse 1. Let's just read the first eight verses of this chapter. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, from thy brother's house into a land that I will show thee. That's all that God said to him. He didn't give him anything else, just the fact that, Abraham, you've got to trust me and you must obey me. I will show you as you walk by faith. Isn't that principle still, still true with us in this day? That God doesn't show us all the journey but he will show us enough when we walk by faith. And he said unto him, here's a promise God gave to him in verse 2, I will make of thee a great nation, I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And Abraham departed. An amazing statement made about him that he believed God and he departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him and Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Iran, and they went forth 
to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land under the place of Shechem, under the plain of Moreb, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed, this is the second time he gave him this word, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And then he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east side of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, and Hai on the east, there he builded an altar unto the Lord, and there he called upon the name of the Lord. I want to talk about in this passage, what is the real context of a man's faith? If you were to say that I've got faith, and I am living by faith, then uh, we started examining our faith, what is the context of our faith? Uh, it is found in these beginning of the life of Abraham. The first steps that he took by faith uh, was into the land of Shechem. And the Bible says that in that land uh, there were Canaanites living in the land. As Abraham obeyed God and took a step of faith, God appeared to him in a more meaningful way. And there are two things that he did when God appeared unto him. The Bible said that he built an altar and he pitched his tent. Now if you want to see a man of faith, uh, you see it here in the life of Abraham. Uh, Abraham could talk about his faith. He could say that he had faith. But there were two things that demonstrated real faith that was in his heart. He had a tent, the Bible said, and he built an altar. Now I want to suggest even though these were these were, these were real, tangible things that Abraham had. They are symbolic of what we have as a pilgrim in this world. That's what a real person of faith has. Uh, these two things, Abraham characterized his life all the years of his life. And it demonstrated when people saw him that he was a man of faith. At a tent. You know what that tent symbolized? That he wasn't going to be down here very long. That tent meant that he was on a journey through this world and that he had no dwelling place down here. He was always on the move. When, you, when we study the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, about Abraham, it always talks about Abraham uh, that made a testimony that this world was not his home, that he was a pilgrim and a stranger through this world. He never, he never dwelled, he never settled down anywhere. He always had a tent and he's always moving. And uh, he had set up that tent, but he wouldn't stay there very long. Isn't that symbolic of the Christian life? We're, we're, this world is not our home tonight. We're aware of that. I'm going to tell you, we're on a journey. We are moving through this world and we're headed home, but this world is not our home. While Abraham had a tent, I just want to tell you, we don't, we don't, uh, we're not going to stay here very long. We've got a home built by the Lord over there. And while he journeyed, he had an altar that every time he went somewhere and set up that tent, he would build an altar, and there he would worship God. That was the context of his faith. You say, what were the two things that characterized Abraham, this mighty man of faith? What was it that caused him to stand out as a man of faith? 
I will tell you the same two things says the same thing about us tonight. That as a believer journeying through this world, you'll have to confess this world is not our home. We're just passing through. And while we're journeying, we've got an altar where we can communicate with God and talk with God. These two things made up his life as a pilgrim in this world. Now, for these couple of verses tonight, I want to say a few things about a man of faith and the context of his faith and the context of our faith. The Lord willing, this coming Wednesday night, I'm going to follow right after these verses, and I want to, I want to emphasize in our Wednesday night study, even though he was a man of faith, his faith was not a perfect faith. Now, I will assure you that what God did for him and what God wrought in him was perfect. But as Abraham lived out his life in the context of his life, sometimes he walked by faith and sometimes he did not walk by faith. You're getting too quiet on me tonight. You're having to think that over. Well, that's a good thing you're thinking that. You, you, you mean to tell me even this great man of faith, he didn't have a perfect faith? His faith failed him a lot of times? Oh, he did a lot of things you'll read in his life where he didn't walk by faith, that he walked by feelings and he walked by sight, just like all of us do tonight. And we'll learn about him, how he, how, the kind of faith that fails from time to time. I mean, he did some strange things uh, as a man of God, as a man of faith. I mean, when you carry your wife down into a strange land, and he, 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 is so, he is so afraid that he's going to lose his life, he said, you tell, don't you tell Pharaoh you're my wife. You tell him you're my sister. <laughs> and if he wants to take you for his wife, that'll be all right with me as long as I save my life. Isn't that just like a man? I didn't hear too many women say amen to that tonight. You ought to holler out amen to that. That's exactly what he did. He wasn't walking by faith. Brother, he was trying to protect his life. <laughs> but here at the very beginning, you see the context of the faith that this man had in God. I'd like to say two or three things about this, uh, this faith that uh, what's involved in a faith uh, that'll get you through. Very obvious when you read the text tonight that our faith has to be lived in a real world. If you think about that. Now it is good when you come to study about the land of Canaan. It was God's gift to his people and all of Abraham's descendants. But I would remind you tonight that the land of Canaan was still in this world. And could I remind all of us tonight, you know where God's called us to live out our faith? It's not over yonder in a make-believe world. It's in the real world in which we have to live in. I'll say a couple of things about living our faith in the world, in this world in which we are. By the way, do you know that when Abraham went into the land of Canaan, it was full of idolatry in that land? There were idols in the land of Canaan? Might change our tune sometime when we're singing... Canaan's happy and fair and happy land where all of my possessions land. Well, I'm just going to tell you, in this world, there are always the Canaanites that are living in the land. If you'll notice it, just read with you in, in our scripture. The Bible said in verse number 6 that Abraham passed through the land under the place of Shechem, under the place of plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. These Canaanites were the descendants of Ham. 
they were the ones that God had put a curse upon them. And I can assure you that their lifestyle was contrary to the life of faith. They were not worshiping God in Canaan land. They didn't know the God of Abraham. In fact, if you'll study, you'll find they were worshiping all kinds of gods in the land of Canaan. And right in the midst of all of the idolatry and the cruelty in the land, Abraham, the man of faith, shows up with a faith in God. And God said to Abraham, Abraham, you're going to have to live by faith right in the middle of the Canaanites. Do I need to elaborate on that tonight that tell you the world that we're living in is filled with unbelievers and we are living among the Canaanites who do not know God and do not serve God. And it's alarming to us in this day. It should be alarming to us today about where our nation has gotten to. And there was a time when I was growing up, I always grew up with the idea, and they thought, you know, for the most part, the majority of people in this world we were living in a Christian world and that uh, we, had, uh, we had God as our God in America. And some have said, we're no longer living in a Christian age. We're living in a post-Christian world that we're living in. That is beyond the time when we used to recognize God and when we used to honor God in our nation. But I want to tell you, if you try to honor God and recognize God in our day, you'll find out what the majority of folks out there are saying about you. But I'm here to say tonight that it's right in the middle of that kind of world that Abraham shows up. And Abraham and his family, they're called to live by faith in the world among the Canaanites. And I'm just going to say tonight, We cannot allow what is going on in our world and in our society to smother out our faith and to discourage our faith because we better remember that we're living our faith in God in a world that does not know God and cares nothing about the things of God. And it's in that kind of world that Abraham, God sent him in there to live by faith. He had to live it in this world. And I remind all of us tonight, we're called upon to live for him right in this world. Could, could I remind you secondly tonight, not only, I, I read this and studied this, I thought how amazing this is. He lived, he had to live for God in the world. Among the Canaanites, but he had to live there with his family. Now, some of us say, well, Pastor, I already knew that. Well, I don't know if we understand the impact of that. Moses, when he wrote this, uh, gives that little detail describing the life of Abraham as he begins to walk by faith. And he ends up in Cana where there was idols and there was no, no knowledge, no respect for God. And in the midst of that world, he had to bring his family, his wife and his children and all of his family right in the middle of all of that was going on. He had earthly responsibilities. If he had a family, you better believe he had some responsibilities to his wife and his children and his in-laws and his servants and everything that he had. In fact, we're told when you study the life of Abraham, that he had a large household and uh, he had to make sure his family was taken care of. Right in the midst of all of that, with all the cruelty going on around him, here's a man that said, I better take care of my family and while I'm looking after my family, I've got to keep walking by faith with God. 
Could you hear me tonight to me to tell you that this walk of faith does not mean that you're to walk away from your family and deny your family or not take care of your family. You you honor God by walking by faith with God and taking care of your family. Family responsibilities came along with that. A lot of folks think, well, here's, here's the choice. I've got to choose between my family and choose between that and God. Could I remind you tonight that a man of faith, a woman of faith, they don't choose to neglect one above the other. They walk with God and they take care of the family at the same time. So he had a tent and he had an altar. And I would remind you there are too many in our day they just want to tent but they don't want an altar uh, they got a they got a tent but they don't want to have an altar would it surprise you that Abraham never did build a house do you know that Abraham never did build a house nowhere in the scripture will you ever find this man lived all this time and trusted God and had God as his, as his God he never did build a house. He lived in a tent all the days of his life. And if you say, well, that's strange. Well, you, you do understand God's people are strange, don't you? You know, they don't live like the world. They don't nail down. They don't set all their wealth and all their hopes into this world. In fact, the New Testament tells us in the book of Hebrews, trying to explain about this, said that Abraham, when he walked with God, he was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. He wasn't looking for anything down here. He was looking for heaven. He was looking for a place where God was building for him. He lived by faith in this world. I want to suggest tonight that it is possible to live by faith in this world, in this life. And I will assure you, there will always be Canaanites in the land that does not know our God and does not honor him. But maybe God put Abraham right there, gave him all the promises of God, and here he is sitting right there in the middle of the Canaanites. And he's got a family that he's looking after, and he's got a faith in God. Can I encourage you tonight to remind all of us Do I need to remind you that it ain't getting no better in this world? <laughs> you said, preacher, I came to church to be encouraged tonight. That is encouraging because that means we're closer to home and one day we're leaving all of this behind and we're going to be in the city of God one day. Yeah. Amen. And so I, I just want to tell you, don't look for things to get better down here because this world is not our home. We're just passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The Lord had a home for us. Abraham was on a journey. He is looking for that city. The Bible said, whose builder and maker is God. And so Abraham had to live out his faith. Just keep in mind, this wasn't no... Just a little simple kind of faith. This is the father of all who believe. This was a great man of faith. And he had to live out his faith. It didn't make him anything special and didn't protect him from the world he's living in. He had to live out his faith in the world. And do you know where God's called us to live out our faith? It's in this world. I want to move to a second emphasis found in this text. Not only does... Here's the context of real faith. We're called to live it out in the world. But the context of real faith is to be lived before the Lord. Did you notice what Scripture said? After verse 6, said there was Canaanites in the land and Abram had got to the land of Shechem and in the land there were Canaanites in the land. And the scripture said in verse 7 that the Lord appeared unto Abraham and gave him a promise. You know what he said? 
he appeared unto Abraham again. It hadn't been long they had appeared unto him, and he comes again to him. And he said, Abraham, just remember now to your descendants, I'm going to give you this land. The Lord told him that. The Bible said, the latter part of verse 8, that it was there that he builded an altar unto the Lord. And it was there that he called upon the name of the Lord. Now here's a man we consider the greatest man of faith in the Bible. And he is living among the Canaanites. But he's really living his life before the Lord. He's, he's living for God in Canaan. Somebody says, well, I, you know, I wish I could get somewhere there wasn't no Canaanites. And I, be, I might be able to honor God. You know, God may have placed you right where you are so you can honor him among the Canaanites. Do you know God got you there where you are tonight, not by accident? But here he was. He was called to live. He was living among the Canaanites, but he was really living before the Lord. Can I remind you tonight, that principle hasn't changed. Here's Abraham, but I want to tell you, the same faith Abraham we've got in the same God and the same place, what we do, we live our life in this world, but really we're living our life of faith before God. I'd like to say a word or two about that. This living before the Lord um, was really a confirmation of his faith. The revelation of God came to him and he confirmed this man of faith um, he's making his journey he goes through Haran and he now finds himself in the land of Canaan and when he gets to the land of Canaan and looks around and sees all the Canaanites and all of the idolatry that is in the land, God appears to him and says to him, Abraham, I know where you are. And you're not here by yourself. I am still your God. And I've just come to confirm your faith. I, I just point out something in your study of this. When he started out this journey, God really didn't tell him where he's going. Uh, God simply said to him, you just leave and you go to a land that I'm going to show you. And when you get there, I'll confirm your faith. He doesn't receive any kind of confirmation until he had acted by faith. Now, I think there's a reason for that. Because if I, I think that if God had said to Abraham, Abraham, you leave where you're going, and I'm sending you over into Canaan, and over there's a bunch of idolaters, and there's, a, there's people that worship false gods, and you're going to have to sit down with your family right in the middle of all kind of idolatry. Abraham might have said, well, I don't think I want to move to Canaan. But God said to him, you go and I'll show you. And he ends up in Canaan, and looks around. He didn't have any other believers there. <laughs> People in black like us would say, could somebody tell me where the, where the nearest Baptist church is I can go to? Could I tell you, they didn't have any churches down in Canaan. You say, but I've got to have my church. I'm going to tell you what you've got to have. You've got to have the Lord in this world. Better than anything else, you better have God as you go through this world of Canaanites. He didn't have, he didn't have a whole bunch of uh, people there to encourage him. And he's wondering, am I in the right place? I've been obeying God. I've been following God. Am I in the right place? And out of the blue, the Lord appears unto him. Aren't you glad that God will confirm our faith in him? But I remind you, he didn't get confirmation of it until he began to walk by faith. 
until he began to act on what he said he believed. You see, our obedience reveals our faith. Did you hear me tonight? You can't claim that you believe God if you don't obey God. <laughs> I mean, our obedience is an act of our faith. We don't obey to get faith. We obey because we have faith. God had said to him, you go and I'll be with you and here's what I'm going to do. And Abraham shows up in the land of Canaan full of idolaters and all kind of people and nobody knew God but him and his family. And while he's there in that land, God appears to him. And God confirms it. Has God ever confirmed your faith? Has God ever spoken to you and just confirmed your faith? He had, God showed him, and God confirmed his faith. When God showed him and confirmed his faith, here's second, second thing in this passage. When God confirmed this man's faith, The Bible said he builded an altar unto the Lord. And it was there he called on the name of the Lord. Could I suggest to you tonight his altar was a confession of his faith? You know that when he built this altar, it, it, it was a part of his life. And everywhere he went, first thing he did when he got somewhere, he just built an altar. Probably he gathered some stones and built them in the form of an altar. And do you know what an altar was for? He would offer a sacrifice on that altar. The very word uh, translated altar has the idea of sacrifice. And this altar was the place that Abraham came before God when God confirmed Abraham's faith and before God and his family, he confessed his faith in God. That very altar where he brought and built before God was his confession of his faith. I'll let you think about that. You know what that altar was when he, when he brought sacrifice put it on? He was simply saying to God, God, I believe your promises. I believe what you say. God has said to him, I'm going to take you into the land. I'm going to give you the land for your inheritance and all of your descendants. And the Bible said that Abraham believed God. And he demonstrated that he believed God and the promises of God by building an altar and there... He said to God, I believe you, and God confirmed that promise. And God saw it. God saw it. Now, I'll be very brief. I'll say a couple of things about what this confession involved. I will. And by the way, what Abraham confessed at that altar, we confess. We, 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 we make a confession. Well, what, what was the confession he made? Well, the first thing, it was a confession of faith to his family. There was Sarah and the servants and all that he'd brought out of they're the Chaldees. They came with him. And I'm sure sometime they wondered what in the world, where is he leading us and what's going to happen? And they finally got there in this land. And he confessed, I believe God. And he made this open confession to his family. And when his family saw him out there at that altar, putting a sacrifice on and worshiping God, they were witnesses to the fact, here's a man that believes God. 
Here's a man that's got his trust in God. Do you, are you aware tonight that we're all making a confession of our faith, whether it's real or whether it's not real? Whether it's genuine or where it's put on. And, and, the, and the most tragic thing about it, the first people that we're making that confession to is to our family. And I will assure you tonight, your family knows if what you've got is real or not. Am I right? I mean, brother, you might fool everybody else, but you'll never fool that family you live with. You might deceive people down to church, but you'll never fool that family that you live with, whether your faith is real or not, whether you're trusting God or not. One great expositor said about Abraham, that it cost Abraham, somebody's getting an alert somewhere, I wonder if that's coming from the Lord, I might shut up and listen, well I was getting them at the house too before I came, Alexander McLaren said about in his exposition of this passage, he said it cost Abraham much more to build an altar than it did to pitch a tent. The tent in which he lived was not very costly. But the altar had to be constructed by the sacrifice of something else. And it became a great cost to him to build that altar and building that altar and laying a sacrifice on it was saying to his family, my faith in God is real. Can I ask you tonight, does your family know your faith in God is real? Do they know it's real tonight? I want to tell you, there are a lot of children growing up, all they can see, mom and daddy, they go to church every once in a while. They show up when they need something. I'm going to tell you, you'll never convince those kids that their mom and daddy's faith is real. I'm going to tell you, faith is real. It shows itself to our family. And, and Abraham, all he had there was his family that believed in God, and he had his family, and it demonstrated faith, what God said he believed, and he said it to his family. Could I just remind you tonight the greatest witness you'll ever have in this world is to your family. The confession of this faith started out with his family. But when he demonstrated his faith to his family, he had also demonstrated his faith to other people. Do you, don't you know he, they had never seen anything like this? And here's a man and his family and all of his servants show up in Canaan. And he didn't act like them. And, and he's out there, and he's building an altar, and he's putting a sacrifice on that altar. Do you not think they thought it was kind of strange? Isn't that a strange act of worship, they thought? And so it got their attention when they saw this man of faith. How could a man offer a sacrifice unto a God he could not see? Nobody saw this God. Why, you've got to offer a sacrifice to an idol. We've got to make an idol. You've got to see this, this God that we're worshiping. You've got to make one with your hands so we can offer a sacrifice unto him. And here's Abraham out there offering a sacrifice unto a God you can't even see. Brother, his consecration and his dedication was a witness to everybody around that saw it. His worship in the living God and all his pagan neighbors around him had never seen anybody worship God in that manner. I want to tell you what, his commitment was a revelation to his family. Here's a revelation to everybody else. And by the way, could I just remind you tonight that your commitment to God is the greatest testimony to this unbelieving world. I'm just going to tell you what they see us do and what they 
watch us and how we worship God is a great witness to them tonight. So I've come tonight to say that living the Christian life is a life of faith. And it involves a tent. For Abraham, it was a physical tent. You just wrap it up, take it down, take it with you. When God said to stop, he had stopped and set up that tent. Tell me that wasn't strange. <laughs> Seeing a man going through the desert didn't want to have. I live in this tent. And every time he set up the tent, he'd build him an altar. And there, there he would worship God. But could I say tonight that in the midst of our world, We're still building altars. And like Abraham, we're on a journey through this world. That is the context of our faith. And tell me if a man's got genuine faith or not. He will not settle down in this world. He'll not be satisfied in this world. He'll say, this world is not my home. I've got to live in the world. I'm not denying the fact that I've got to live in the world. But this world is not my home. And also, I've got an altar where I can talk to God and I communicate with God. And I'm going to tell you, those two things have never changed since the days of Abraham. Even in our day, that's what we do. We're journeying through this world, are we not? I say to you, don't, don't nail down too deep in this world because we ain't going to be here too long. Amen. You say, well, how much are we going to leave behind? We're going to leave it all behind. We're going to leave everything behind. But I will assure you, whatever we leave behind here, it's going to be better when we get over there in that land. That is the context of our faith. That's what reveals how genuine our faith is. Well, that weeds out a lot of people, don't it? That weeds out a lot of people just come to church, just to become in church, and it's the proper thing to do. It's, it's a... Well, I've got to be well liked in the community. I've got to be well thought of. But I don't tell you, that don't matter one bit to God. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, you better be, th you better be thinking about, am I, am I pleasing to God? Is your faith genuine tonight? Do you have a real, genuine faith tonight? It's, it's in, these, in Abraham's faith that he had a tent that he journeyed. And then when he stopped, he built an altar. And I'm sure at that altar he gave thanks to God. And he worshiped God. I've got the feeling that he offered thanks and praise to God for every step of the journey. You may not have a, and you can, that's fine. You may not have a physical altar you built somewhere. A lot of folks do, and that's fine. But I think there ought to be one in our heart that we bow on the, before the Lord in our heart every day, and it confesses to God. I want to worship you, and I want to praise you. Would you stand with me tonight? Everybody stand, our heads bow just a moment, please. When you examine your faith, when you look deep into your heart and your faith, do you find faith there? Is your faith genuine? Is it real? I'm not asking, is your faith from your side, is it perfect? Because our faith falters. But what God did in the heart of Abraham genuine, real. And even when he failed, he'd always find an altar. And he'd always build an altar and he'd find himself on an altar talking to God. And 
So I just challenge you tonight and encourage you. When you fail, find, find an altar. Find a place to pray. Find a place to commune with God. That'll confirm your faith. If you don't ever have a desire to do that, you better check up and see if you've got real faith. But every true child of God will find a place and altar. They'll talk to God. And it'll be a confession of the reality of their faith. Just to their family and to unbelievers, the world that they're living in. But no matter what happens, here's a man, here's a woman of faith that believes God. Now, Father, I pray that you'll take these couple of verses of Scripture tonight and you'll seal them in our heart. We'll, we'll look at them and we'll learn what it, what it means to be a man, a woman, a young person of faith. Walk by faith in a world that does not know you. Bless our folks that are outside tonight. I know they have they've been there and they prayed for this service. I pray your blessings upon them. May they receive the help that they came for and they'll leave being fed from your word. Bless this congregation and uh, guide us, help us to know we're going into a world that you know where we are. Lord, we're there with our family. We're there with our friends. We thank you we can live for God in this world. It is in your name we make our prayer. Amen and amen. Bless you. Will you find somebody to speak to tonight before you leave? We're glad that you came. Let